Psalms 107. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Now this this psalm would be God helps those in trouble. As we'll go through this chapter, we'll see maybe a historical event that had happened. But God's good. God's better than good. God is the greatest. He should get the thanks for everything. I mean, Memorial Day, I mean, we thank our troops and all that for the service they've done, but God is the one giving us liberty and peace. We must not forget God in this day. Problem is, not only have we forgotten God, but now we forgot the vets. And it's sorry that when a nation forgets God and forgets his vets, that you're just going down to a spiral, hellish darkness state. For his mercy endureth forever. God's long suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. And for a Christian, he, he wants you to have the full blessings and full, full everything that he can give you. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So those who have been redeemed by God should be the ones giving thanks and and declaring that God is merciful. It should be their testimony to everybody, saved and lost, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. For us it would be Satan. For Israel would be all the nations around them and Satan. And as you see this chapter here, it could also be Babylon. As we go into this chapter here, you, you, we'll be seeing that what we're studying in our church is Ezra, Nehemiah, as we read tonight. We are redeemed from Satan. God bought us back by his shed blood. God has redeemed Israel from Egypt, buying them back the, the, the blood of the Lamb. God has redeemed Israel from Babylon, buying them back, giving everything back to go to the temple. And gather them out of their lands. Jeremiah 3, 18, 16, 15, and 23, 8. From the east. The sun rises in the east. From the west, from the north, from the south. Israel has gone all over the place. There were some that went to Babylon. There were some that went to Egypt. There are some that ran towards Edom. And Edom stopped them. Tried to stop them. I believe that's the book of Obadiah. Uh, north. Babylon's the northeast. Listen, there were Jews in, in Europe when Paul was there. That didn't even know anything about Paul. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Now that can be Exodus and Deut Deuteronomy and Numbers. But also if you take it in the book of Ezra, when they go back, what city was there? Just rubble. There was no city there. It was just a pile in heaps and, and a forsaken city. At least one thing, when David went and conquered Jebusite, or the Jebusites, there was a castle there. There was buildings there. There was a city. They had walls. And David made a command, whoever can go up to the gutters of those walls and conquer the city, that will be the chief of my army. And that was Joab. What did the Jews, after they left Babylon in Ezra's time, what did they find? Nothing. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Now, I don't know about Ezra. It's a long trip. I don't know if we're to, being told. Well, it, but in the wilderness, their soul fainted. Now, this is the Ezra time. We're, we're told extra information. If this is the wilderness with Moses, okay, yeah. How 
How about if it's at the end of the tribulation period? Toward the midst and end of the tribulation when they're running from the Antichrist. Wow, isn't it interesting that this chapter can cover many different things? The time of Moses, the time of Ezra, or the time yet to be spoken of. And it is, if it is future, hungry and thirsty, well, they're so fainted. Why would they even think about going back, turning around like they did in Moses' time, and they had a leader, and the Bible records they were going to go back because they missed the melons, the leeks, and the onions and all that. If the Jews in the future were to turn back, the only way you're going to get food and all that is if you receive the mark. And we're not told during Ezra's time if they hungered. As Brother Knox declared to us, that they didn't have enough animals to ride upon. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. God is the God of deliverer. When you call upon him, why hasn't God helped me? Maybe you haven't called. You haven't asked, James says. You ask not, you don't get anything. You receive not because you ask not. Try asking God. Even ask God for the foolish things. You don't know. And if you, if you ask a mess and it's just for lust, James says, you won't get it. But at least you asked. You have enough faith in God, to ask God for help. I mean, is it wrong when doctors will tell you, you know, there's nothing we can do? Is it wrong to ask God to do something? And seeing God work. Because people pray. How many times, or how many people are going to be in glory? I mean, born again Christians are saved. And the Lord's going to say to them, I was waiting to help you. All you had to do was ask, seek, and knock. But you never did. Imagine whatever you can go through trouble on this planet and then just think, just because you didn't ask. Sweet hour of prayer. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. All right, number one. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. That's not the children of Israel. That's the children of men. Now this is going to show four times in this, this chapter. That, that phrase we just read. Eight. Verse eight. Eight is a, is a number of new beginnings. Start over. Seven is complete. Jews don't count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And as you read your Bible, if you look at some of those numbers, it's like, why did they word the numbers like that? Because they don't count like we do. So you've got to take Gentile and American ways and English ways out. And you got to be where you are. You are in a Jewish book amongst the Middle East nations. Now, verse 9, fruit of the Spirit, for he satisfies a longing soul. And fills the hungry soul with goodness. Well, isn't that great? The fruit of the Spirit. Those who are doing right and those are seeking God and those that are praising God. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Not, not flesh. The soul. Listen, when your soul gets filled with food... God can use you anytime and anywhere, as long as you provide yourself a clean vessel. You can walk away from a conversation and say, wow, I had no part in that. Such as sit in darkness in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. That's not what you want to be. Darkness and shadow of death, you're going to die, you're in bonds and iron. Handcuffed. 
because they rebelled against the words of God and contend, contemned in the counsel of the Most High. Now, you can't say that in verse 10 is Paul in jail because Paul never disobeyed the word of God. But once, four times. You say, well, how can he do it once, four times? Four times he was told not to go down in Jerusalem. So where did he end up? He ended up in jail. But it says here that some of your afflictions, some of your imprisonment, and it may be a literal jail, or imprisonment of your body is because you have rebelled against the words of God. God told you to do something and you said no. I'm not going to do it. All right, suffer. Put the booze away. No. Put the cigarette away. No. Get back to your wife. No. Go witness to somebody. No. And there are consequences. How many people who have family members or friends die and they sit there and wonder, well, where are they going to be? I never witnessed to them. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor and fell down and there was none to help. Woe be to you when, when you get in that state that there is no help. No one can help you. Money can't help you. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Why am I in the most predicament that I am that I am completely out of control and out of any resources because God's trying to get your attention. You know, I, I, when I read Job today, I, I realized it said, not only did it say boils, it said sore boils all over his body. God wanted Job's attention. Too bad three idiots showed up with a big mouth where God could have got Job's attention without all those chapters. I mean, Job's first time he opened his mouth, he cursed the day he was born and all that. But you think maybe the next step, if those three friends weren't there, God would have stepped in and worked on his heart. And then Job would have said, okay, Lord, why is this all happening? I don't mean, why has this happened to me, God? I mean, God... What is the reason? What are you trying to teach me? And God would have dealt with him. You know, Job's wife wasn't there to take care of him. You know, Job's children were impossible to be there. Even the herdsmen weren't there because they were killed or taken captive. And God may do that to you in your life to get you in your trouble. The cry upon the Lord where there's absolutely nothing else you can turn to. And it's sorry that some people have to go through that. One of the things I learned with the jail ministry, sometimes God's going to put you in three walls and one door that someone else controls. You get a guy who's really upset because the guard would not let him go to, go to Bible study the previous week. Well, if you didn't commit the crime, you wouldn't be in here. And now you know how precious it is to be in it, but too bad they don't learn that. He brought them out of darkness, exactly where they were put, and the shadow of death, restoration of life, and break their bands in sunder. Well, the Antichrist has got a sentence of death upon him. He wants them butchered. He wants them in jail. 
And they run to sell a feature where God has a pre place prepared for them, Revelation 12. And if you read about that, there is some kind of cloud that goes over the land. And they're getting food by perils. The second time, all that men would praise the Lord for his goodness. What goodness? He took you out of darkness. He took you out of bonds. He's giving you life. Listen, that's a Christian life. You were in darkness. You were in bonds. You're going to die. And Satan had you chained to your sin. And now you are set free. Do you praise the Lord with goodness? Do you take the praise that God has done for you and give it to others? Because it says, and for this wonderful works to the children of men. Doesn't say Jews. It doesn't say church. It doesn't say sense. Do you tell the wonderful works that what Christ has done for you in your life to other men? Two times if you didn't get it yet. Verily, verily. For he has broken the gates of brass. Eh, that's hard to break. And cut the bars of iron asunder. That's hard to do. Peter's in jail one night, and listen, they had locks and chains on the bars and all that, and he's walking through, and the gate just opens right up. Paul's in jail with Cyrus one night, and the earthquake comes and snaps off all the, the restraints. Jesus goes down in hell, grabs the keys to death in hell, opens up the door, and walks over to paradise. How are you guys doing? Can you imagine Abraham? Lord, I told the rich man that there was no one that can cross this gulf. How would you do it? And I got the victory. You guys ready to go for a little trip? You want to go on a missionary trip? You guys go to Jerusalem and hang out for 40 days. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. You know what? If you are a born-again Christian and you're afflicted with sin, you are a fool. Right there. You got it? Because Christ is giving you the ability to flee to sin. Christ is giving you the, the ability to be victorious in your sin. You're a fool if you continue in it. Because you're doing it on your own power. Or you just don't want to give it up. And if you don't want to give it up, don't you go asking God to forgive you for it. Because he's not going to. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat. They draw near unto the gates of death. They won't eat. We're going to go on a starvation diet. We're going to starve ourselves until we get something done. <laughs> and then you die and what was done. And it may be your disability that you can't eat. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. Oh, you mean transgressions and iniquities, and you're going to kill yourself? You want death, and then you call upon the Lord, and he'll save you. Can God save somebody who has suicidal intentions? Yes. <coughs> Can life get so bad that you want to commit suicide and yet there's hell? Yes. And it's not a suicide uh, toll-free number either. You just may not get anybody on the other side of the phone. At least with God, he'll answer you anytime and all the time. That's why you got to mark yourself as a Christian, as a true Christian in the Bible. Because one of your friends or family, somebody that you know may get down to this point, and you have the answer. If you don't be who you are to be, who they know where to turn to? I let my light shine. 
And how many people have gone to this account that we read in this chapter and did not cry in the Lord because they had no idea how to cry in the Lord or who could help them cry to the Lord? There may be times that somebody you know because they know who you are and they have an idea of what you are. Because listen, Satan knows who you are. They may come to you and say, listen, can you pray for my son or can you pray for my mother? You... They know who to go to when you mark yourself. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Can God use you as a vessel to send his word? Or do you got a modern perverted Bible? That's not God's word. Can you be a vessel where God says, I want you to go like Elijah. I want you to go to the king and I want you to tell him who he is, what he is, even if he can take your, your neck off. Nathan, I want you to go to that king. I want you to tell him what I tell you to tell him. I don't care if he gets angry. I don't care if he hates you. I don't care if he puts you in jail. You better speak my words. Micaiah had a, had a perfect thing from King Ahab. I don't like him because he never speaks good. Oh, that guy, he uses hell, 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 hell. Black Baron of Fruity Tootie. Pansy preacher that uses butterflies and, and daisies with his messages. you got to be faithful to God's word. Number three. All that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Can you be faithful with the, to children of men with God's word? And after that, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving. Declare his works with rejoicing. You go tell someone else how you got saved. You tell what the Lord has done to your miserable, rotten, pitiful life that you have been living on your own with Satan. And come to tell that a date and a place and an event that God has come into your life with his word. And are you a witness? How's that? Do you sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving by going to church and worshiping God and singing praises and reading his word and praying for others? That's a sacrifice. That's a sacrifice of time. Next. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, sailors, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. So I guess, I don't know about today, this day and age, but I guess if you were to go talk to old seamen and all that, I guarantee they'll tell you things about God. The Bible says it's so. God called the first four disciples were fishermen. They were sailors. Peter had wonderful stories to tell. Of what the Lord's done for him. For he commendeth or commanded and raises the stormy wind which lifteth up the waves thereof. Ooh, storm. God gives storms. God's in charge of the wind. No, whirlwind uh, tornadoes can't be of God, no. Yes. Tsunami couldn't been of God. It says stormy wind which lifted up the waves thereof. It's not El Nemo. It's not global warming. They mount up to the heaven. I mean, it's not really they go to heaven, but they're high. They go down again to the depths. Up and down, up and down. Their soul is melted because of trouble. I guarantee you, when you're out in this vast ocean or even the Mediterranean Sea and there's nothing around you but this little little piece of steel or piece of wood and everywhere else around you is just water. No land in sight. I guarantee you be frightened.
They mounted to heaven, go down their deaths, and their souls melted because of trouble. They reeled to and fro, stra staggered like a drunken man, and are at their wit's end. Yeah, there's that expression, at their wit's end. You know, when, when Paul was on that ship, and that ship, man, they were throwing all the cargo off. They were about to jump off the ship themselves. These were professional sailors. Luke, a professional medical doctor, is, is recording that he is helping them trying to get that ship ship shape. You read where he says, and we took off all the tackles and we threw everything. That's Luke writing that while Paul's down inside the ship. Paul and those sailors are scared. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. And he bringeth them out of the distress. Jonah chapter 1. The two or three times that Jesus took care of the storms in the life of the disciples. The story of Paul and his shipwrecks. Can I be out in the vast sea where there's no land as far as the eye can see? And can God help me? He maketh the storm calm so that the waves thereof are still. Read Jonah 1. When they got rid of the sin. They picked up their sin and threw it overboard. Then, then everything got calm. Maybe you need to pick up your sin and throw it overboard. You know what happens when it goes overboard? You don't get it back unless you want to get wet. And then you're not going to get it back when you throw it overboard. It says they are glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them into their desire haven. Listen, you throw that sin overboard and everything gets still in your life and you're happy, you got peace, you're not going to want to go back in there and jump in and get it again. That's the pig that went back to the swallow. That is the, you know, the, the mire. Ew. A dog that returns to his vomit that goes and gets their sin again. Let the Lord desire you to the haven. Now, if you put an E between, before that A, you get heaven. Put an E in there for eternity and you get heaven. God will bring you into your heaven. So the, so the hymn is the haven of rest. Number four. All that man would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Four times we are given a testimony of God going into our stormy, wicked, darkful, sinful lives and giving us the victory. And all four times we are told that men would praise the Lord and then go tell of his works to the children of men. Four times. If there's one thing the Bible commands you, it commands you to tell testimonies of the Lord. Not talk about ball teams. Not talk about stupid things on TV. Not talking about garbage. Praise the Lord. That's just a word today. Three words. Praise the Lord. PTL. Praise the Lord. And you don't even know what it means. Some people say it don't even know what it means because God has never been praised in their life. Woman come and praise us the other day because a cop wouldn't give her a ticket for panhandling. I ain't praise the Lord. Not after what you what came out of your mouth afterwards. Should have ran over there, got that cop, and told him give her a ticket. And give her a ticket for blaspheming the Lord. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people. Now, you've never been in a congregation of a people, of a church, and no, you never, God, I mean, church is where you worship the Lord. You don't worship people, do you? Huh? Now our next performer, I like to thank all the mothers. I like to thank all the fathers. I like to thank all the grads. All the children will have their Easter baskets. How do you exalt him? 
And our next song will be about anything it can be. How can you exalt him if, you, if you're in a congregation that doesn't even have his word? How can you exalt him when you got a Bible that takes Jesus out of it? How do you have a how do you have a, a, a exalting God if if you got a Bible that says that Jesus and Satan are one or brothers? And praise him in the assembly of the elders. All right, so let's go to a nursing home, find a bunch of Christians, and find out what they're talking about. Are they talking about God or the lousy food, or you know, they got each other's teeth? How about the how how about the pastor and the deacons of the church? How about you to go put the glass up to the door and find out what they're talking behind closed doors? I wonder what what you find out. The praise of the Lord there. Hmm. What about them positioning the church at the dinner table? He turneth rivers in into a wilderness. That happened in Numbers. And the water springs into dry ground. Anyway, he turns the rivers into wilderness. Okay, that's the opposite. I was wrong. He dries it up. He can stop the rain. The fruitful land and into barrenness. I'm not going to give you no more fruit. How many? Fa seven famines, I think, are in the Bible. For the wickedness of them that dwell therein. Now, tell me where it says Israel there. America is going into a famine because of the wickedness that she is doing. And if it's not a famine of food, it will be a famine of the word, the Bible says. And he maketh the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city for an habitation. And sow the fields and plant vineyards, which may yield fruits of increase. God may destroy one particular land so you can get where you're supposed to be. Abraham got in a lot of trouble for being down in Egypt where he wasn't supposed to be. Isaac got in trouble for being in a land where he wasn't supposed to be. Israel got in trouble for keeping those in the land that they weren't supposed to keep. He blesses them also so that they are multiplied greatly and suffer not their cattle to decrease. When you get where God wants you to get. You may have trouble in your life. You may have barrenness. You may lack water. You may be lacking fruits because you are not where God wants you to be. It's not being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's being where God wants you to be and not being there. Read the book of Jonah. How many, how many people did Jonah save on that boat? We should have hoped no. And none of them. Absolutely not one of them. Yeah, he got the people in the boat saved, but that's not where God wanted him. How many people could have been on that boat? No more than a hundred, at least. We don't know how big the boat I'm just saying. A hundred would be a good thing. How many people in that city? He may, let's, let's say just around number 100 on that boat got saved because of Jonah. Would I be safe to say 100,000 got saved in the city? Double the fruit, quadruple the fruit of what he got on that boat, but he didn't belong in that boat. How many people died in Nineveh while Jonah was on that boat? Jonah was not where he was supposed to be. Again, they minished. That's a funny word I saw today reading. Minished. All my times reading the Bible, I never saw that word minished. I never heard that word minished. 
It means lessen. Lower, less. And broken low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. Troubles, problems. He poureth contempt upon the princes and causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. How many people today are walking around without the way, the truth, and the light? They may have religion. They may have nothing. They may work. They may, whatever their career, whatever it is, they're not walking in no way, the Bible says. They're just in the wilderness. They're not producing no fruit for God. You know what man was supposed to produce fruit for God? You know Cain and Abel were supposed to be holy fruit to Adam and Eve without sin? But Adam and Eve rebelled against God and look what happened. Sin. Murder. If you are not doing what God wants you to do, Christian, you are in the wilderness. If you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, you're in the wilderness. Very little fruit is produced. You know, it's funny, a, a lost man can give someone a Bible, buy someone a Bible, and that person that got the Bible got saved. Well, that's generally not so, but it could happen. You can get some fruit in the wilderness. Why not get all the potential of the fruit and being where God wants you? In the bosom of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the sacrifice of Calvary and the, the victory through the, 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 the tomb that was emptied. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father right now and be justified from your sins and be part of the vine and produce fruit. You know, I may not be the vine that holds that particular fruit up, but I can be in the, in the stem of that plant providing the food. You know, when you give money to missionaries, that's money that goes up through the plant and, and helps that fruit to mature. You're part of the plant. Whether you're actually holding the fruit itself or you are in the cell system. But Christ is the vine. You need that vine. Yet said is he the God, yet said is he the poor on high from affliction. And maketh him families like a flock. Think about all the family that Paul has in heaven. And probably his family that rejected him. Paul, I believe in my heart, is still gaining fruit. Now how much, I don't know. Now whether my salvation... I'm not going this ask this, this apostic thing. I am not saying that, but... Our salvation is founded upon Jesus Christ. I am saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He sent out 11 apostles. Through those 11 apostles, the family tree, one of those apostles took part in some, and you keep on following along, to where I got saved today. Think about how many people is from one of those apostles to me today. How many people have gotten saved along the line for where I am saved? I was witnessed by Joe Caswell. I wonder who witnessed to him. I wonder who witnessed to him. I wonder, I wonder how far that... I, no, not how far. I wonder how many people are there and who are there when you draw that line back to Jesus Christ and just before that, the apostles. How many people now that I am saved have been saved because of me? And how many are being saved because of them that got saved because of my testimony? And because of Joe Caswell? And because of the man before him? And because of the man of him? Now I got a doctrine. And I can't prove this. So you, you can take this in the garbage if you want to. You don't have to believe this. And I don't think, if, you know, if I'm wrong, the Lord Jesus Christ will take a crown away. But the, Jesus said many times, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. You take that last man that is saved. 
He's the last man. What if he's the first man to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ? And you finally get down to the 11 apostles who went out like the Lord told them. Ooh, we, you talk about a lot of crowns. What if at the judgment seat of Christ, God lines up those 11 apostles? Hey, you stand over here. You stand with Luke. Well, I mean, no. you stand with Matthew. You stand with Andrew. You stand with Peter. You stand with Paul. You st because that who that is the foundation of, of the one who went out and, and told everyone about Jesus. Now, just because Paul was a, was a, the missionary to the Gentiles, that doesn't mean that as a, gen, a Gentile today that it could have been Peter. Maybe my line goes to Cornelius. He had his whole family there. Maybe your line is of the Ethiopian eunuch that went back to his queen in Ethiopia. That was Philip. Somebody had to tell Philip. Then I believe the last shall be first and the first shall be last. The very last one to be judged will be the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? He's sinless. So what better crown to give the Lord Jesus Christ at that moment but give us all his crowns as he mounts up on that horse and said, let's go. We are done with the judgment seat of Christ. You have given me your crowns. Let's go get them. How about that? How about all the crowns that you were able or No, we take that. All the crowns that you earned, and you give them right back to what, what does it say? It says he has what? Many what? He has many crowns. What if he comes back with your crown on his head? All right. Here we are in the ark. The land, the sheep have been separated from the goats. Brother Stanley Hayward. Yep. Okay, here's your crown again. You go over to Daytona Beach. You give me a crown that is on your head to go over there. Yes, I am. Martin Luther, step forward. Here's your crown. You go to Germany. Luxembourg. Brother James Knox, step forward. Here's your crown. You go to the land. Go right in that street where they gave you all kinds of hard times. That, that's your place to go. How about that? Now, I can say he, uh, that's something I believe. I've really not studied, but I mean, if. What a glory to give it back all to Jesus Christ. And then it says we'll be, we'll be rulers. A ruler needs a crown. You know, Jesus Christ will always step down and give to us more than what we give to him. you got to think of it like that. Yet said is he the poor on high from the fleet. I, I'm poor. The Bible records in Corinthians that Jesus was rich, but he became poor. I am poor. I am dust and spit and the breath of God. And I'm going to be seated in a golden street city with gems I've never even seen or never even held. I could go to a jewelry store and see those gems, but I'm not going to be a old one. You think if I walked in a jewelry store and said, let me see a di pure diamond. You're going to be watching me. I'll be able to go up to heaven and touch you. <laughs> I one angel, what are you doing? Just, that's a diamond. <laughs> I never had one of them. That was a woman's best friend when I was on that earth. And here it is. It's the lowest of all these, you know. I am poor. And maketh him families like a flood. I don't know how many people have been saved because of what I've done. I have no idea. But I got family. I got family that's rejected me and rejected my Lord and God. I reject them. If you're not going to church, you're not serving God, you don't love him, I don't want anything to do with you. 
I'll go hang out with somebody who does want to do something for the Lord and loves the Lord and will talk about the Lord and not give me a hard time about serving the Lord. Listen, when Demas left, Paul said, bye-bye. Loser. That means family. That means friends. That means anybody. Because I got families who love the Lord. The righteous shall see it. I'm righteous. I'm going to see it. And rejoice. I'm going to rejoice forevermore in glory. I rejoice now. And all iniquity shall stop her mouth. There is no iniquity in, in New Jerusalem. No liar. No no one that maketh a lie. No whoremonger. No adulterer. Amen. Glory to God. I will be able to speak in New Jerusalem and never have to think once. I never have to bite my tongue in heaven. I got to bite my tongue now. And I'm very sarcastic. But still, I bite my tongue. Not in heaven. Everything I say will be pure 100%. Whoso is wise. All right. Want to be wise? And will observe these things. Even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. And what is it? Let's go back again. Oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness. And for his wonderful works to the children of men. It's all about God. Salvation's plan is just a fairy tale, but their lies don't change the truth that Jesus died for you, and the word says his returning could happen any day. I'm gonna shout it from the housetops, proclaim it from the mountains. 